Welcome to the Borgen Project podcast. Our guest today is Josh Paul. Paul was a director at the State Department where he worked for 12 years, primarily involved with sending weapons to foreign countries. And early in the war, when the death toll had reached about 2,000 people in Gaza, he publicly quit. Paul wrote in an op-ed in the Washington Post, on October 7th, when Hamas massacred Israeli civilians, I felt sick to my stomach, both because of the horror being visited upon in the sense, and because I knew of what would come next. Israel has a right to defend itself, but the country's track record over a half dozen major clashes in the past 15 years suggests that thousands of Palestinian civilians will die in the process. Sure enough, Israeli requests for munitions started arriving immediately, including for a variety of weapons that have no applicability to the current conflict. Josh, welcome. And what was kind of going through your mind as all this was playing out? What was your big concern um, and what kind of uh, led you to, to make this decision to step back? Hey, Clint, and uh, thank you very much for having me. So I think I had three big concerns at the time, and I'm sorry to say that uh, each has been really confirmed in their own way since. Uh, the first, of course, was the scope and the scale of the destruction that was being meted out in Gaza, wreaked by U.S. provided weapons, U.S. origin weapons, uh, weapons that the U.S. had provided to Israel in the past, and the weapons that we were then being uh, asked to expedite uh, the delivery of. Uh, in fact, I, I recently went back and looked at the numbers, and at the time that I left the State Department, my last day there, functionally was October 18th, uh, there were actually already over 3,700 Palestinians uh, who had yeah. been killed in Gaza. Um, and of course, that number has now multiplied at least by 10. Um, the second part of it was I was concerned and had been for a long time that our policy towards Israel was broken, um, that we were pursuing, uh, first of all, a broader policy uh, premised on the viability of the Oslo Accords, um, which was increasingly disconnected from the reality on the ground, whether that be the siege of Gaza, uh, whether that be the uh, expansion of settlements in the West Bank, whether that be the clear statements from Israeli leaders uh, that they did not support a two-state solution. Uh, and yet we seem to continue to push forward in this fantasy land. Um, and then my third concern um, was that, you know, whether it had been in the past when I tried to raise those broader policy concerns, or in the moment as I raised those concerns about what was happening in Gaza, uh, there was no appetite within the State Department to discuss them. Uh, no yeah. interest in pausing for a second, uh, in thinking through the consequences of our actions, in thinking through our policies. Um, and, you know, what I've seen since then as well is that that's a microcosm uh, in many ways of the political debate in America. Um, it is beginning to shift through the pressure and the sacrifice uh, of a lot of people uh, in Congress, in the private sector, students, of course. Um, but at the same time, we've seen an immense amount of effort to shut down that debate. Uh, and the same was happening within the State Department. So those were the three main reasons why I left. Why, why do you think in the State Department that was there? Was that from the top down kind of thing? Or is it just because it's always been such a safe policy to be very pro-Israel that people didn't want to think about anything that wasn't remotely no, viewed as? Yeah, I mean, it yeah. definitely is from the top down. And I would say it definitely is politically driven. It, the same constraints don't exist at the working level. Um, and certainly, you know, the director level and below, um, people have frank discussions, people raise concerns, yeah. people draft memos. Uh, but as soon as those hit anyone at the political appointee level uh, or at the Senate confirmed level, uh, things just don't move. They get shut down. And I think the reason for that is that historically uh, it has been a third rail uh, to, to criticize Israel. And that's not just because of, you know, longstanding U.S. policy. That's because there is active uh, political pressure, active fundraising, active electioneering, uh, particularly directed towards Congress that has shifted Congress to a position where it sees great benefit as soon as someone pokes their head above the parapet in shooting them down. Um, yeah. And no one wants to be shot down. People, you know, are in the State Department, uh, particularly, you know, political appointees and Senate confirmed officials uh, to make their name and to try to make a difference. And there may be a broad range of issues in which they want to make a difference. And so is it really worth risking your career uh, over this one, you know, niche issue as it has been for, you know, certainly many decades up to this year? Um, so I think it is, it is inherently a political problem. So people, people who take a stance in government and will step down or, or whistleblowers that I think there's a, it, 
it, there's a fascinating place in our hearts of all Americans <laughs> and kind of curious what this process looks like. So maybe, maybe kind of walk me through it. Cause it's, a, it's definitely a brave thing to do, especially over the is issue of Israel and, and at that stage of the war. What, as you, what was your day like as you built the days leading up to, are you waking up in the morning and brushing your teeth and be like, Oh my goodness, I don't want to go to work. This is, I don't want any part of this or what was kind of your, yeah, your, uh, I mean, psychology at the time, I guess. So fair enough. I mean, so within a couple of days of October 7th and as Israel was beginning, um, you know, to attack Gaza in the wake of that, um, you know, I, I did write an email to a number of colleagues, including some senior officials in my bureau uh, and elsewhere in the department, uh, you know, laying out exactly the concerns I've just laid out and saying, look, you know, uh, the track record here is that violence will only lead to more violence and more suffering and the policy isn't working and let's just pause and rethink this. Um, you know, that was met, at least in terms of official response, with silence. I had a couple of people pick up the phone and say, you know, either Brady Mel completely agree with you, but nothing's going to change. Yeah. Or, you know, are you crazy? Are you trying to, you know, get fired? <laughs> um, but, um, but, but also, uh, but I agree with you. Um, you know, and then watching the devastation unfold over the week that followed, you know, I began thinking and, and being asked on a daily basis to approve major arms transfers that were, you know, coming through from Israel. Um, you know, that was something I wasn't comfortable doing. And I was, you know, spent the first few days trying to exert the leverage I had as, you know, a function of my position to stop things, to slow things, to make people have these policy discussions. That wasn't working. Um, so I started drafting a resignation letter. And, you know, that wasn't a, an immediate process. I, I went through several drafts. I would sort of come back to it each evening, reflect on, you know, the latest catastrophe, what had happened that day, um, amend the letter a bit, um, come back to it the next day. Um, and at the same time, to be clear, what was, was you know, perhaps not particularly interesting for your for your listeners, um, but I happened to be just going on personal travel uh, to the UK uh, that week. Um, and I went, uh, I was still, you know, as we all are post COVID, um, you right. know, never away from the laptop. Um, so working remotely, essentially. Uh, but as I was sitting in, in London, actually drafting my resignation letter, I said to myself, well, I'm not going to submit this till I get back, uh, till I can go read the intelligence, see what's actually happening, uh, in case I'm missing something in case there's some angle here, uh, of, you know, something the Biden administration is doing to rein this in or something that's happening on the ground. I don't understand. So I came back to the US uh, and one of the first things I did was I went and I, I looked at the intel um, and saw that, I, no, I wasn't actually missing anything. Um, and that's the point at which I decided, okay, you know, now I have the full picture and I just can't stay any longer. Yeah. So, you, you know, weapons, military weapons is a good as well as anybody and you know their usage and the purposes of different weapons and, and war strategy. Was there certain weapons that stood out to you as like, this is clearly being used to kill as many civilians as possible or destroy as many buildings as possible? Or what was some of the stuff that was of particular concern? Yes. And those fall into, I think, two broad sets. Uh, and the first set, frankly, and, and the one that had been of concern prior, most concern prior to October 7th was actually firearms. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion recently about the Leahy laws uh, and, you know, the restriction in law that we can't provide U.S. security assistance to a unit that is credibly alleged to be violating gross violations of human rights or committing gross violations of human rights. Um, and most of those in the discussions I was involved in, and some of those have now come into the public eye uh, as a result of the State Department's recent, I would say, very failed action, but, but form of action yeah. on Leahy vetting, um, all related to the West Bank and, and therefore all related to, or almost all related to firearms. Um, and so that's the first issue set. And I think we continue to see concern with IDF use of firearms in the Gaza context, right? We've seen videos uh, you can find online, for example, uh, of a child walking with his mother, waving a white flag and a sniper shooting him um, mm. and extrajudicial killings and all this sort of thing. So firearms are one set. Um, and then, of course, in the context of, you know, the urban uh, environment in Gaza, uh, big bombs, heavy bombs, uh, you know, 2000 pound bombs. Um, 1,000 pound bombs, um, to a lesser extent, 500 pound bombs, whether or not um, they are, they come with guidance kits, right? So you can either drop a bomb and from the aircraft and you sort of, you know, maneuver the aircraft to the right point and the computer tells you approximately where it's going to hit, uh, which is not particularly accurate, particularly when you're talking about a 2,000 pound bomb that has a lethal blast radius of up to uh, three football fields or more than that, actually. Um, or you can attach a kit to those bombs, a, a joint direct attack munition kit, which Boeing makes, 
a spice kit, uh, which uh, an Israeli company makes, uh, to make it more you know, precise, to know that exactly where you're going to hit. But it really doesn't matter in an urban area if you drop a 2,000 pound bomb on a marketplace, if you drop a 2,000 pound bomb you know, on a building near a hospital, yeah. um, accuracy isn't the issue, proportionality is the issue. Um, so I think those, by and large, are, are the two sets of weapons that I'm most concerned about, are firearms and big bombs. And, and for our audience, too, and correct me if I'm wrong, so when the U.S. was fighting ISIS in Mosul, the, we, the, the, we didn't use 2,000-pound bombs. We used uh, stuff that was like one-fourth the size, I believe. So when we're talking about dropping a, a, a bomb that hits a heavily populated area and, can, and the spread of it is, like you said, over a base 6,000 feet away is killing people, that that's kind of says a lot about how the war, their, you know, what their intent is in that region. No, that's right. We conducted our campaign, counter ISIS campaign, very differently. I think, you know, even in the context of Raqqa, which was where we used, you know, the heaviest munitions and there was the most mm-hmm. fighting, which was, of course, the ISIS stronghold in Syria, which was the last to fall, um, there were very, very few uh, 2,000 pound bombs used, um, as opposed to Israel uh, in the context of Gaza, which has dropped literally thousands of them on Gaza. Um, you know, in the first two or three months of the war, Israel had dropped 22,000 uh, air to ground munitions into Gaza. Gaza, of course, being a, 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 an area about the size of, you know, metropolitan Cleveland or Las Vegas. Um, 25 miles long, seven miles wide. It's, uh, right. It's very small. Yeah, at its widest. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's an immense amount yeah. of uh, explosives uh, going in there compared to anything that the US had done in its counter ISIS campaign. And if you talk to US military personnel, I mean, I was on this uh, task force recently that did, conducted an assessment of the use of US provided weapons in Gaza, uh, one of whom, uh, members of the task force, this guy, Wes Bryant, uh, had been a JTAC, a uh, Joint Tactical Air Controller. Uh, U.S. Air Force, who had, uh, you know, been a strike planner uh, for much of that counter ISIS campaign, and said that he, in his experience in in that campaign, had never seen anything like the negligence uh, of of Israel's approach in Gaza. And negligence, I think, putting it politely. I've I've found that interesting too. Like a lot of uh, military service guys that worked at, you know, were stationed overseas in Afghanistan, and Iraq, have been a bit appalled, some of I've heard, <laughs> on, on just the yeah. types of methodology being used there. Yeah. No, I think, I think military folks more than anyone gets this because they understand, particularly given the US experience the last 20 years, yeah. um, you know, what this sort of campaign, what succeeds, what doesn't, and, you know, where the line, as Klauswitz says, is between, you know, war and politics, and that ultimately um, you don't succeed purely through the application of force. Uh, you have to uh, take into account the civilian population, you know, not just because we care about civilians, as I think we do, but also because you cannot win uh, if you are, you know, um, bombing the civilian population into rubble. And that's a lesson that dates back to Duhay. That's a lesson that dates back to the Blitz in London. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that came up a lot after 9-11. The 9-11 Commission talked about the importance of when people have no hope and opportunity, that tends to be where the conditions that allow the, the bad guys to operate freely or, or recruit better. And so, yeah, right. I think and that's... Yeah, I mean, there's a story just, I think, today in the newspapers that the Biden administration is, you know, shocked uh, to be calculating now that there may be as many as 30,000 new candidates for Hamas as a result right. of Israel's actions in the last seven months. That shouldn't shock anyone. Yeah. Um, that's that's exactly how recruitment works. Well, especially when you're targeting civilians, because if you're a civilian there, like, what, why wouldn't you join, right? Because you're, no matter what, they're going to try to kill you and you're being starved at the moment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's I, mean, just I wouldn't necessarily like... say why yeah. wouldn't you join because I think there are yeah. a lot of people in Gaza who, you know, do not appreciate uh, the, yeah. the, you know, do not appreciate Hamas's worldview, do not uh, agree with its tactics. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, one can certainly see how, you know, if, if your family has been wiped out, um, you might have a bone to pick. Right. Yeah, you, have, you have no hope and no opportunity and you've, yeah, lost major losses. And yeah, that's, it's, yeah, it's a recruitment tool for terrorists. And essentially, I mean, that's when they get people that are in desperate situations and need, need a way out. That's a big part of it. Um, okay. I don't know if this is something you would be able to talk about, but Israel has the, the lavender system that gets into AI stuff. Is that something you're able to discuss and how that... To some extent. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, all of us who are talking about this are, are broadly drawing on open source reporting. Uh, yeah. that has greatly come out of the fantastic joint Israeli-Palestinian uh, product uh, or, or newspaper 972 magazine. Who, you know, Lavender, as you've referred to, is, is one of several AI systems uh, Israel has been using to identify uh, targets um, and, you know, without much human oversight. And that's, you know, I mean, there's been a long-running 
discussion in military circles and in international legal circles about you know what is the right balance between the use of AI, whether integrated into weapons themselves or into targeting. Um, it's clear, you know, based on the reporting that Israel and, and Israel has has broadly confirmed some of this reporting uh, through official channels that essentially they are using uh, an AI system that you know looks at who is in WhatsApp group, uh, WhatsApp groups, um, who installs and uninstalls WhatsApp, um, you know, who uses certain keywords where they can identify those. Um, and doesn't do a whole lot more due diligence uh, beyond that. Um, so uses this system to identify thousands of targets. I think it's important to note as well, part of this is not just the use of the AI, AI but it's also how Israel is defining Hamas. Um, so, you know, they are not, when they, Israel talks about Hamas, they're not just talking about uh, militants within the, uh, you know, the uh, Hamas brigades. Uh, they're also talking about people who are members of the Hamas party who might be police officers escorting, for example, as they have been humanitarian assistants. Uh, yeah. They could be, you know, street cleaners. They could be anyone who has worked for the Hamas government is Hamas, uh, therefore may be a legitimate target in, in Israel's eyes. <clears throat> um, and so they have identified literally tens of thousands of individuals as targets. Of course, they are not using, you know, small weapons. They're not using small diameter bombs. They are sometimes, but, but by and large, they're, they're using, you know, big caliber weapons to hit these targets. And then they're also doing so in a way, according to this reporting, that doesn't only identify the targets using AI, uh, but then also uses a separate uh, AI process called Daddy's Home uh, to identify when those targets return to their homes, where their families are, in order to strike them there. Um, and so it's, I, I mean, to my mind, it's just a mind-blowing, you know, it, it, this is not how you conduct war. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, th there's no rush here, right? I, there's no immediate urgency. I think Israel has significantly degraded Hamas's capabilities. Yeah. So it has every capability to exercise tactical patience, to do what the US would do, and understand pattern of life in an area before it strikes, understand what the civilian footprint is. Uh, but instead, it is just sort of pushing uh, names through a system and then striking them when they are with their families. Is, is there, does a human sign off on it at any point? Or is it just autom the automated, the, the drone? knows daddy's home and then fires or what's the so so there is some degree of human sign off in some yeah. of this um you know i think in the u.s context given the civilian risk that sign off would be at very high levels probably at the brigade level division level possibly even up to sec def or president depending on what the potential uh human toll would be uh, yeah. it is clear that the sign off to the extent there is sign off is happening at the tactical level and we saw this right with the uh with the strike on the world central kitchen uh, which is the strike I think Israel has been the most transparent about what happened, where, you know, yeah. that literally was happening within a talk, within a, a tactical operation center, uh, rather than any sort of escalation uh, above that level. Um, and for many of these targets, we also know or suspect through the 972 reporting that there is not uh, any sign off other than confirming that the target is a male. Yeah. <laughs> What, so, I mean, you, you know weapons, like, <laughs> uh, and we, we hear a lot about the tunnels. Is, is there an effective way to take out the tunnels and, and I guess starting with there, but then also knowing there's hostages in the tunnels, what, how would you, what would be a, a light casualty way to go after? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, look, I mean, I think that is a tough question. Uh, let's start by recognizing that Hamas didn't start, I mean, those tunnels didn't start with Hamas, right? So the tunnels, for example, under Al-Shifa Hospital, uh, former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, has publicly said on CNN, uh, were constructed by Israel uh, yeah. in order to, you know, conduct operations, uh, you know, under that hospital in the event of a conflict. Um, so the origin of the tunnels, I think, is, is maybe at least tangentially relevant. Right. There are something like 300 miles, if not more, of tunnels under Gaza. Um, and so a campaign that assumes that any tunnel is a, quote, terrorist tunnel uh, that is legitimate to be struck is therefore a campaign that argues that all of Gaza can be destroyed because that's right. the only way you can get to the tunnels is from, you know, bombing from above. Um, and so, yes, that absolutely does present a, a military tactical challenge. Sometimes, frankly, you do have to risk uh, personnel where you believe there is a high value target. Um, and go into those tunnels in person rather than just dropping a bomb. But sometimes as well, you know, I think this just underlines that, that the answer has to be uh, a different military approach and one that is more blended with the politics, um, you know, so that you can maybe get to a point where you can agree to have inspectors, where you can agree to have, you know, uh, some sort of, you know, multinational project 
to address this problem rather than just saying, well, Hamas has built tunnels or there are tunnels under almost all of Gaza, uh, therefore we can just bomb everything, because that's just not, you know, um, in accordance with international law. It's not uh, proportionate. Um, yeah. It's not discriminate. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I do agree that that presents a military tactical challenge, but it can't be that the solution is, therefore, everything above ground is fair game. Has it been pretty disappointing how your colleagues and leaders have and have not responded to this? And I, I think of like someone like Samantha Power, who head of USAID administrator, her whole career is focused on genocide and, and war crimes and literally wrote a book about U.S. leaders not acting on <laughs> addressing war crimes and genocides. Uh, and now she's head of USAID, an organization that we, we focus a lot on you know, helping them and their efforts to do global humanitarian work overseas. And, um, pretty quiet, I'd say. I mean, definitely not stepping down and make, you know, I, I, that's definitely someone I, I would think if she wrote a strong op-ed and stepped down and said, this is genocide, this is war crimes, we need to not be funding it, would have some meaning, but pretty, pretty quiet. Has that been frustrating that some of your colleagues, both internally and externally, aren't doing more on this? Yeah, of course. And I mean, I think that this point, frankly, begins at the very top, right, where President Biden has built a reputation on being a man of empathy and compassion. Right. Um, and that empathy and compassion has just been entirely absent, it feels like, for the last seven months when it comes to Palestinian lives. Uh, and then, of course, you know, at the Secretary Blinken level, at the Samantha Power level, and plenty of former colleagues of mine as well, who, you know, I, I, I think are good people, are, you know, all great to work with, um, and I know do have hearts, uh, and yet, um, uh, you know, do not seem to be doing not even all they can, but but anything really, uh, to pull back this administration to change its policy. Um, so of course that has been disappointing and frustrating. At the same time, uh, you know, I want to be clear that there's also been a lot of really inspiring people. Um, you know, we saw in the last couple of weeks, for example, resignations of a uh, U.S. Army major who served in the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, who wrote, you know, very passionately about his decision to step down. Uh, that he believes that we are violating international law, that these believes, you know, these are unlawful orders, um, and that this is not how the U.S. military would work. And we've seen others uh, obviously resign. We've also seen people standing up and taking part in protests in the streets. Uh, we've seen people submitting dissent channel cables. I know there are a lot of people also who are staying in their positions that maybe don't relate directly to arms transfers, but do relate to humanitarian assistance, uh, yeah. because they feel that there is still some good that they can do within those positions. Um, and so I think, you know, there have been a lot of inspiring stories, many of which uh, have not yet been told and may never been told about people who are really doing a lot on the inside um, to, to try to shift things. The uh, International Criminal Court uh, came out seeking the arrest of both the leaders of Israel and Hamas. Um, the Biden administration or Biden per personally came out and kind of said, this is outrageous and put up a big <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> discredit campaign, more or less. Was that surprising the degree that he kind of was basically trying to discredit it? Or what, what's, the, what's his angle there? Because at some point you got to sort of acknowledge the reality on the ground. And, and yeah, or does he have too much political liability by not doing that? No, I mean, I think that actually touches on what might be the longest lasting impact of this conflict. Um, obviously, the longest lasting impact is on the lives and families of Palestinians who are being killed. But, but in geopolitical sense, um, you know, what this conflict has done, I think, is just shredded the credibility of the United States, of the West uh, in general, uh, in, in, you know, our you know, public support for what Secretary Blinken always calls the rules-based international order, um, at a time when we are in an era of strategic com competition, uh, when the U.S. is facing relative decline, that's not absolute decline, but relative decline compared to rising powers, uh, and I'm particularly thinking of the People's Republic of China here, um, where our credibility, our values are our greatest tool. And what we are doing is not just shredding our credibility now, um, but we seem to be in the process of actively shredding that international rules-based order of, of undermining the ICC, of undermining uh, the International Court of Justice, uh, of undermining the United Nations, um, even of undermining you know, partners and allies uh, who step up to recognize a Palestinian state uh, or to take other uh, legal actions. Uh, whether through joining cases at the ICJ or, or perhaps in the future pursuing uh, their own criminal cases under universal jurisdiction. Um, and so I really fear that the United States' response here uh, is going to end up doing vast, vast damage to our own interests and you know, leading to a world uh, where there is not a, a global standard 
uh, for the rule of law, where there is not a global application of international law, um, but simply a, you know, various, you know, sectors where, you know, people choose what laws apply to them and what laws apply to their partners and allies. And it, we go back to, you know, all, you know, a, a chaos, a sort of, you know, pre, pre-World War I sort of, you know, might is right. Uh, and I think that will be very damaging uh, for our own national security in the longer term. Yeah, there, there's been reports that Netanyahu is worried about this charge. And I think it says something about the fact you want you want world leaders worried about these charges if they're doing stuff they shouldn't be. And there right. needs to be some That's kind the of point. I mean, yeah. the point is not just accountability on the back end. It is also deterrence on the front end uh, yeah. and the knowledge that if you do take these steps, there will be consequences. And if you know that there will not be any consequences, uh, that is a significant, I think, you know, deterrent that is gone. Uh, and I think therefore leads to more malign actions and more harm. I got to ask you, well, I got a, an expert, a man of your expertise on the show here today, but, but I've always been, uh, you know, I've, countries I go to that there's issues of landmines and uh, cluster bombs and the U S yeah. has always been kind of hanging on to them on different levels. Um, I talked, I have a friend who was out in Cambodia and he visited an orphanage where like is all these kids had missing limbs from cluster bombs that had been dropped, you know, decades ago, but there's still this long, you know, the long lingering war effect. They kind of just yeah. seem to not explode and hang out forever until kids find them. What, what's the, is there, is there a strategy behind us not really cracking down on these or being reluctant? I, I know we've made some progress on the landmine ones. But. Yeah. I mean, so we'll start with the good, right? So the good is yeah. that, you know, yes, well, I guess we'll start with the bad. The, the U.S. has dropped a, an immense amount of cluster munitions and used landmines uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, and, you know, uh, but I, I think mostly in those fields. Um, but the U.S. is also by far uh, the world's leading funder of humanitarian demining. Um, yeah. And I think Vietnam is almost approaching the point now of, of being able to predict that it will be landmine impact free uh, in the coming years. Uh, we're seeing significant progress also in Cambodia, in Laos. Um, the U.S. is also continuing to fund the cleanup of World War II. Uh, munitions in the Pacific Islands. Um, it has also funding the cleanup of landmines in Bosnia uh, and in the Balkans. It is also funding uh, the removal of unexploded ordnance left behind by ISIS uh, in the form of uh, improvised explosive devices, IEDs, uh, across Iraq and Syria. Um, and so, and also likewise in Latin America, in Colombia in particular. So has been doing an immense amount of good work to clean this up um, at the same time. Uh, the U.S. is one of the few countries left in the world that has not signed on to uh, the Oslo and uh, the Oslo Convention and um, uh, on, you know, which makes landmines, uh, yeah. anti-personnel landmines illegal or um, the Ottawa Convention on cluster munitions. Um, I think the U.S.'s argument for that has changed from administration to administration. The current administration's argument on landmines is that, you know, we will not make any, I mean, their policy is we will not build any new anti-personnel landmines, uh, but we will not sign uh, onto that convention because we still think that they have an important role to play in a potential uh, Korea contingency, right? Where you could yeah. have human wave attack from North Korea uh, and landmines still play a relevant role. I think there's some legitimacy to that. I think, you know, in all of our, um, you know, we, we do have a massive military presence and unfortunately that does force some very tough decisions. Um, but I think that, you know, that there are occasionally arguments to be made for that, so long as we are narrow, very narrow in linking those those arguments to our commitments to specific interests of allies and partners and are not undermining um, the commitments that other countries have made um, or undermining those, uh, you know, conventions or treaties, um, you know, in, in the broad world. And I think the goal should be uh, to end the use of anti-personnel landmines. Um, and, and take it forward from there. But I think, you know, that is probably conditions dependent and we'll see if we get there. It, would you say, is there, um, I feel like that the U S is often not signing all these different treaties. Is there like a, does it come from a place of like, we just want to be able to do not have any limits on how we conduct a war or is it, is it not that? Or, no, I, I mean, know. I think, yeah, so, yeah. you know, I think it's an interesting question, right? And I think, I mean, the way international law works, right. Is that it is consensus based. Right. Um, you know, you do not have to sign on to any particular treaty, um, you know, but the goal is not to undermine uh, those who have done. Uh, and so I think the ICC convention is a good example. OK, you know, America hasn't signed on to the ICC convention, but 
should not be undermining the ability of those who have, such as Palestine, uh, to bring a case, uh, should not be undermining the validity and the functionality of that system. You know, and again, I think this is also a reflection of the fact that it is easier to sign on to uh, a convention like Convention on Landmines or Convention on, on, on the Rome Treaty, the ICC Treaty, um, if you are a country that doesn't deploy your forces overseas very much, doesn't get involved very, in very many contacts, uh, co uh, conflicts, uh, you know, if you're, if you're Switzerland or Denmark or something, than it is if you are the US and you are present around the world, involved in conflicts constantly around the world. Yeah. And so I think the discussion to be had is more about the US role um, rather than why the US isn't signing on to particular treaties. Uh, at the same time, I would certainly strongly support us signing on to the ICC treaty because I think you know, there has to be accountability for war crimes. And you know, the ICC is ultimately a court of last resort. It is there for when the courts of a national, at a national level do not pursue accountability. And so if we believe in our own justice system, that should not be a concern. If we believe that we will hold people accountable, uh, then that should not be a concern. Of course, the track record as well, if you look at Guantanamo, if you look at the invasion of Iraq, for that matter, um, is that we do not always hold our own people accountable. Uh, and therefore, there has to be some sort of backstop, I would argue. Let's, so you're, you're a teacher now out in, um, out in Iowa, a college? I or, was, I was. That was, was just okay. a, that was a short term gig. A back temporary in gig. Okay. Yeah. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on this? <sighs> I don't know if I'll call it an age divide. There's definitely a little bit of an age divide on the issue of Gaza in the U.S. I think polling shows that. Yep. Um, I have theories. I'll, I'll send one out your way and you can knock it down or tell me, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I think some of the older generations, um, they may be new people who are Holocaust survivors. They have very strong connection, compassion for what people went through in World War II and the need for a safe space. And, and there's kind of, that's, I think, some of the, where some of that the connection lies. I think the younger generation, um, you know, they have their own social media and they're seeing these clips of the carnage being going on in Gaza. Um, I found it really interesting that ICC and some of their evidence with some of these video footage clips of the, you know, the Israeli defense, the Israeli soldiers of what stuff they were doing and posting online. And so that that's stuff, you know, TikTok generation saying, but the other older generation isn't necessarily because it hasn't been a very well covered war. I mean, Israel doesn't allow uh, the media into Gaza at all. So what we are seeing is primarily coming out through, you know, leaked stuff on social media. Um, but what, what, what's your thoughts on why, why there's this divide and what, what, what's your, yeah. What's yeah, on? I mean, I think there is a generational divide, although at the same time, the polling also shows that across all generations, opinions are shifting. Uh, but they're certainly shifting the most radically in the younger generation, or being formed, I should say, uh, most radically uh, differently in the younger generation. Uh, I think you're right that part of that goes back to history. And I don't think it's necessarily the Holocaust to say. Maybe it is for, for the very oldest. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, the, the nature of the U.S. relationship and certainly how it's been presented over the years. Um, you know, I would say going back to 1967 and this image of David versus Goliath, um, going back to 1976, right, the uh, Entebbe operation on America's 200th anniversary uh, that recovered uh, American hostages from, from an airplane in Uganda. Um, and this image of, you know, Israel as this outnumbered, you know, strong, bold uh, country surrounded by enemies, which I think, frankly, it has also been fueled by racism, um, right. and bigotry, anti-Arab bigotry. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of that. I think there's also very strongly religious flavor a lot of the time. Um, and I mean that both in a Jewish and Christian context. Um, yeah where in their very different ways, uh, but there are strong uh, trends within both of those communities um, to idealize uh, Israel uh, and to develop an image of it, I think, that is very different from the reality of it. So you also now have a, a, a younger generation um, that is, as you said, exposed to TikTok, exposed to social media. Um, there were, there's been polling uh, that if you segregate people's opinions of Israel based on where they get their news, the most pro-Israel community are those who get their news solely from cable news. Um, and then it sort of goes down from there uh, yeah. to those who get, you know, just most of their news from social media. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's also, of course, the fact that the new generation is, is less religious than those that have followed it. Uh, that probably plays a role. Um, so I think there are a number of factors there. And, and I think as well that ultimately what's going to drive this forward even more is the reaction that we've seen to protests on campuses and, and colleges around the country. Um, where I think you probably started off with not a lot of protesters, not a lot of people caring about this. 
Um, but once universities and colleges come in heavy handed, um, you know, students, you know, get upset. I was I was at uh, Dartmouth College uh, a few weeks ago um, and witnessed, you know, a protest being broken up by police with by riot police. Um, and I was sitting in a classroom the next day with some of the students and one of them said to me, you know, I, I don't care about this issue. I don't see eye to eye with, uh, you know, the protesters on it. But when you start arresting my friends, I'm going to be there the next day. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about, you know, um, so I think that's a factor as well. I think the, the heavy handedness uh, and the clear, clear bias of this generation of political leadership um, is only, I think, shifting the needle more. Yeah. Um, so give us the, the, uh, what was it like to be you after all this came out and blew up? Were you like trolled? Were you followed by guys in suits and glasses that look mysterious? And what was the, what's kind of been the fallout? No, I, or, I mean, yeah. you know, look, I mean, for sure there have been some people, you know, who've said nasty things on Twitter, um, right. but, um, and, and sure, you know, in the, in the immediate aftermath, I was, you know probably looking over my shoulder a bit more than I normally do. Um, but but no, not really. Um, you know, and I don't know if that's because I'm not on Twitter, I'm just on LinkedIn. And, you know, you don't get that many nasty <laughs> comments when everyone's professional network sees what they're posting, or if it points to something broader. I mean, I've heard the same from others who've resigned that they, you know, expected uh, much worse reaction than there has been. Uh, I think people respect the decision. You know, people have said, well, I disagree, but this if you're going to you know, protest this issue, this is the way to do it. You don't do it from within, you do it from without. Uh, I'm not sure I fully agree with that, but, but you know, okay. And on the contrary, I mean, I've been, you know, very surprised by how positive the reaction has been. I thought that I would be, you know, um, trying to find a job overseas or something like that. I thought I would be yeah. untouchable, I mean, in a bad way, that no one would touch me in DC. On the contrary, I've been welcomed into a lot of new communities, a lot of new networks, a lot of new friendships, a lot of new opportunities. Um, so it's it's really been... Uh, quite different than than I think it could have been. What um, give us so give us like the the State Department one hundred and one. So I think most Americans kind of understand what the State Department is, but don't necessarily know all it's involved with and and the importance of that particular agency. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'll, I'll start broad and then I'll go narrow to why we even talked about the State Department here. Um, so obviously, the State Department is America's you know premier diplomatic uh, agency is responsible for our foreign relations. Uh, with governments around the world, with countries around the world, uh, and for our diplomacy, our communication with those countries, uh, as well as, of course, for looking out for the interests of uh, Americans overseas, uh, which is an important part of the role as well, or the mission as well. Um, and so as part of that, or the way it organizes itself, I should say, um, is within the State Department, um, there are about 30 different bureaus, each with its own mission set. Sometimes that mission is focused on um, you know, a region. So there's a bureau responsible for the Middle East. There's a bureau responsible for, uh, you know, East Asia, etc. Um, sometimes that uh, bureau is focused on a function um, or a tool of foreign policy. And, you know, the way that the US has seen things, at least since the post-World War II period, since the Marshall Plan, uh, is that arms transfers are a tool of foreign policy. They're not just a, a means of building up the capability of allies. They're not just a means of exerting uh, military power, but they are a tool for building relationships, for bringing partners closer to us. Um, you know, once a country is willing to work with you on their most sensitive defense capabilities, they're probably willing to talk to you about other issues as well. Um, and not only that, but they are also reliant on you uh, for their supply of spare parts, munitions, etc., uh, which gives you a lot of leverage. And that's why there is this thing called the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs in the State Department, which is where I used to work. Uh, which is responsible for security assistance, for arms transfers. Uh, it's part of the State Department because it is a tool of foreign policy. It gives America influence, uh, it gives America leverage. And one of the things that been, has been, you know, particularly frustrating for me in the last few months um, is to see, you know, the State Department arguing from the podium at the daily press briefings that we don't tell other countries what to do. Um, this is precisely <laughs> that is why exactly what we do all the time. Yeah, right. I mean, this is precisely why my job for the last twelve years was yeah. in the State Department and not in the Department of Commerce, because this isn't just about trade, this isn't just about uh, defense capabilities, it's about American influence and foreign policy. I'm uh, particularly in engaged in the Ukraine. What's your thoughts there on what, what it'll take weapon-wise, or what, what's the, uh, yeah, just any, any thoughts on what's going on down there? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I think, 
you know, in some ways, Ukraine is the counterfactual uh, to what is happening in Israel-Palestine, right? Uh, where in the context of Ukraine, I would argue uh, you have a sovereign nation uh, that was has been invaded twice, right? First in 2014. Uh, and now uh, even more brutally uh, and viciously by Russia since 2022, um, and to which the US and the West is rightly uh, providing the means to defend itself, uh, while I think treading a very fine line uh, against the potential for nuclear escalation. And I think a lot of people have said, well, we should be doing more for Ukraine. And, and I, I certainly agree that the delay on assistance imposed by the Republican Congress for many, many months, since from basically from October uh, until just last month or this month, uh, was outrageous, was deeply damaging to Ukraine's security, cost thousands of Ukrainian lives, uh, yeah. and imperiled the credibility uh, of deterrence in Europe. Um, that's, but, you know, in terms of the more technical and tactical decisions that are being made about US support, uh, what munitions do we provide? Uh, where can Ukraine use them? You know, I, I think you can make a lot of arguments that we should be doing more, but I think at the end of the day, uh, as distant a risk as it is, uh, global thermonuclear war is not a risk one takes lightly. Uh, and I yeah. think it is a very tight balancing act that has to be walked there to to manage that escalation ladder uh, so we don't end up in a very bad place very quickly. Um, and I think, by and large, uh, the Biden administration is doing, doing well on that. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, the Ukrainian military performance has been, first of all, I mean, initially amazing in the beginning of the war. It's a very different war now. It's a much more difficult war. Um, and Russia just has more resources to throw at it. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not particularly optimistic uh, that Ukraine will take back all of its territory. Um, but I think what we need to do, and I do agree with the Biden administration on this, uh, is that you know we all agree this will end in negotiations, but we need to make sure Ukraine has the strongest possible hand walking into, that, into those negotiations. And the way you do that is by demonstrating a commitment to you know, keep supporting them uh, in the fight until those negotiations come about. It, it's to me the the Israeli and Ukraine things like something like polar opposite worlds, right? Like I feel like Ukraine goes to great lengths to, and you might know more intelligence than what you would do than I do on this, but they seem to avoid civilian casualties and really focus yeah. on targeting Russians, and they're very aware that they need to behave, address corruption, all that stuff in order to receive weapons from the United States. Then you got the Netanyahu version of Israel, which is like we're going to do whatever we want. You can't tell us what to do. We're you know we're going to drop two thousand pound bombs on. Civilians right. and next to hospitals and yeah, so yeah. I mean, I mean, so not only are the, I would say, the circumstances flipped in that you know Russia is the occupier in Ukraine, and we are opposing them. I would say Israel is the occupier in Palestine, and we are supporting them. Um, and and you also see some similar tactics, right, in terms of strikes against electricity grids, strikes against dams, strikes against hospitals, uh, etc. Um, but you know, Ukraine has to literally beg. For, uh, military support, uh, whereas Israel and Netanyahu demands it uh, and assumes it, uh, yeah. and in fact, you know, goes crazy when there's even the slightest, you know, question about it. Um, which, you know, I, I, I think, given the relative importance of the Ukraine conflict uh, to the West versus the Israel-Palestine conflict, you know, it's just again an upside-down world to me. Um, but that's the world we're in right now, and I think again that that's about politics rather than policy. Yeah. How how good is the oh, this is a random question but how, how good is the intelligence and i'll put it this way like do you have a sense that the biden administration folks working on this issue know israel's doing things 10, 10 times more things bad there than we as a public know is that are they having like really is there good on the ground intelligence or are they still kind of relying on news coverage like i mean I'll, I'll tread carefully here yeah. um i would say you know i mean certainly the u.s is you know able to you know be aware of explosions around the world and how many explosions are happening yeah. through you know technical means and, and satellites and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I I I would sus here's the way I'll put this. I would suspect that um, what you see in the media and what you see in terms of reports from NGOs uh, yeah. is probably every bit as good, uh, if not better, if not probably the majority of what. The U.S. itself is seeing uh, through intelligence channels. Okay. Um, you know there are. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of how to put it. Um, the U.S. is focused on U.S. intelligence is rightly focused on threats. To the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. 
we'll wrap it up. Any closing thoughts for our audience? Anything people need to be aware of or any takeaways you want to make sure people understand? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I think, you know, one thing I guess I would say is that it's, it's very easy uh, to get very depressed very quickly about this situation. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, I, I don't think that that's um, the wrong approach. I mean, I think there's a lot to be depressed about here and a, a very dark path forward. And I do worry, you know, not only for Gaza, where, of course, there is now an intergenerational humanitarian catastrophe that will impact that area and its people for generations to come. Uh, but I also worry about the West Bank. I also worry about East Jerusalem. I also worry about uh, Palestinian Israelis. Uh, and where uh, all of that goes in the context of what has been U.S. support for Israel uh, that seems to be unstinting and, and really unchanging. Um, I don't think the, the signs are good. At the same time, uh, I don't think we can just throw up our hands and say, well, you know, everything is, is hell and it's all going to be bad and there's nothing we can do. The U.S. has a vital role here, has immense leverage. You know, again, we're providing... Uh, you know, the weapons that Israel is using to conduct these operations, but also the diplomatic support that enables Israel to continue to dance above international law and above the UN, and also the defensive support that protects Israel from Iran, and also the diplomatic uh, encouragement and effort to keep uh, Israel integrated within the region. Uh, so we have an immense amount of leverage. Um, and the only way that uh, the US is going to start using that leverage properly is if the American people. Uh, push their members of Congress, push their administration, their president, um, to take a different approach. And I think that is going to not be something that happens overnight. But I think it is possible. I think, you know, unfortunately, it's not going to happen in time for Gaza. Um, but maybe it can happen in time for the West Bank. Um, so I think there is a lot of that, that needs to be done. And we here in America are really the ones who are in the best position to do it. So I think we have to you know, recognize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and keep pushing, because ultimately it's not only in the interests of those lives in the region, it's also in America's interest to have uh, a system that, you know, does apply the rule of law globally, that doesn't uh, allow for, you know, the mass killing of civilians, um, and, and that, you know, leads us to a more stable and peaceful and prosperous world. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. This was great and very insightful, and it's it's nice to have your, your knowledge shared with, with our audience. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Really enjoyed it.